So hello everybody and I hope that you're well. Uh, had a good break away, so thank you for your patience in uh, waiting for this next instalment. And uh, come back refreshed and ready to get on with business. The cathedral, well it's raining outside, so the cathedral's moist. Uh, the chapel, as I call it, is a bit disorganised, so we're back into what I'm going to call the chapter house where all the decisions are made. Reminds me one of my favourite rooms of all time is the Chapter House at York Minster. Maybe you've been there. Absolutely beautiful, fantastic place to sing. Anyway, uh, welcome to the Chapter House for this week's reflection. It's a tricky gospel, it's another tricky gospel reading. And when you read it, it uh, it's a bit shocking, really, the, the, the violence involved. I'll explain a little bit. But it's purely allegor alleg that word, allegorical. So therefore, it's not meant to replicate real life in any particular way. But the story goes like this. There was a king who had a, a wedding for his son, and he invited a select number of guests as would normally be the case. They made all sorts of excuses not to turn up. So he went out, found them, and destroyed them. Then he invited everybody else. And they were all feasting, and he pointed out one particular guest who wasn't dressed for the feast. I mean, as if they had time to prepare, etc. Took that person, sent them outside, into the weeping and gnashing of teeth, and his life was ended. Of course, or not of course, but the end phrase is, many are invited, but few are chosen. What does this mean for us today in our humble walk of faith under COVID-19? restrictions. The first is that the king in this allegorical story is God. The son is Jesus Christ. And the feast is the kingdom, the reign of the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God. In this story, Matthew is explaining that God's kingdom is not just for a select few of the specific religious leaders of the time. But the feast of God is open to everybody. But if you choose to attend, you must accept that your life will be changed in some way. To be transformed to be healed, in a sense to find an, a new or a renewing direction. So often we want nice stories of God in our biblical account. So it's quite shocking to be confronted with the violence and the confusion, as it were, of this allegorical text. It's true that God's love is for everyone. End of story. When we accept God's love, it must change our lives. If we carry on much the same as we always do, and let's face it, as human beings, there are certain things that we cannot change on our own. Then it's a little bit tricky. The point of the story is that when we accept God's love, when we accept the invitation to the feast, we also choose to act out of the love which God has given us. We choose to bring justice where there are situations that are false or even evil. And we choose to bring life and healing rather than death and destruction. 
in many ways, God is asking us to grow up as human beings. That actions do have consequences. That we may not like to accept or acknowledge that there will be judgment from God. How that looks like, I'm not really sure. I haven't been there yet. I guess finally, in order to live a life of holiness, there are certain things that we must do, that we must try and do in order to walk in the footsteps of God or beside the footsteps of Jesus. Christianity is a hard sell in many different ways. But under these circumstances we find ourselves in, and with our own walk of faith, or God, as whatever spiritual tradition you adhere to, our lives must be transformed. There must be a change deep within us as a result of our following, as a result of our commitment. This is all, this can be tricky. But as you pray, as you uh, meditate, as you rejoice in the wonders of creation this week, I invite you to open your hearts once again to renewal, to shifting something deep within us, whether we know it or not, so that we too can feast with all the good things that God has given us. We'll see you next week.